Hello, everybody. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Steve Hill. My um, substantive position at Geoscience Australia is as Chief Scientist. Um, but I'm particularly excited to be introducing and chairing today's uh, Geoscience Australia seminar. Uh, welcome to everyone who's joined us both in person in the Ragged Theatre at Geoscience Australia. Um, we've got a good, for those online, you must be wondering, I think we've got a, a good solid uh, representation in the room today, um, but also a big welcome to those that are joining us online. Um, great to have you joining us, no doubt from um, all different parts of the country, and maybe even the world. But um, as the lead in, I'd also like to specifically acknowledge the country that we're uh, presenting from today, the um, lands of the um, Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. Um, and I will say that Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges the, contrib the continuing connection to land, waters and community. And we pay our respects to the people, the cultures and the elders past and present. And as I say, I particularly acknowledge that that will be for people that are watching this also in different parts of our nation. Well, it's great when we have a seminar, a seminar that's given by someone who comes and visits GA to, to present. I think it's also fantastic when we have pre presentations from people within GA that talk about some of the work that we do. Well, today, I think we run a very strong chance of getting the best of both because we have two presenters. So um, a little bit about, about our speakers. So um, this morning, our guest speakers are Alex Roberts from IP Australia and Geoscience Australia's Simon Edmondson. And their topic is, what will the Im impact be of generative artificial intelligence? Or let's just call it AI now. Let's get, let's get with the acronym. Um, it's going to be structured where um, firstly Simon, no, sorry, firstly Alex is going to um, begin by sharing some insights from IP Australia's discovery sprints on the ramifications and implications of Gen AI on the intellectual property system. And then Simon will provide a brief overview of Geoscience Australia's IT perspective and plans for managing generative AI opportunities and challenges. I won't say any more about that. I've got a little bit more here, but I'll let them talk about what they're going to talk about rather than me give an overview before they start. But a little bit about our speakers. So Alex is a long time public servant who joined AP, IP Australia in 2021 after five years with the OECD's observation of public sector innovation. Alex has 15 years of experience working in and exploring how and why <coughs> innovation occurs or doesn't occur in the public sector and is passionate about how government can work better. Alex currently leads the IPA Ventures team at IP Australia, a team set up to apply a ventures approach to the public sector context, which has recently been looking at how generative, generative AI will affect the IP rights system. And a little bit on Simon, who'll be coming in um, in the latter part of the seminar, Simon is the Director of Enterprise Digital Delivery in the Corporate Division of Geoscience Australia. He is currently leading the organisation's response to artificial intelligence with emphasis on the potential benefits and risks of implementing AI-driven solutions. Simon has 15 years of experience in project and program management with a focus on digital service delivery across the private and public sectors. Simon currently chairs the Science Technology Committee at Geoscience Australia, which has been investigating how AI can be levered or leveraged by the organisation to provide enhanced digital national geoscience outcomes now and into the future. Please welcome, firstly, Alex to the podium as the first speaker in this seminar. Thanks, Steve, um, and thank you, everyone, for having me here. I'm going to throw a lot at you today and might make Simon's job harder, but um, I'm coming at this from the perspective of we shouldn't just see generative AI as another productivity tool. This is a bigger shift than that. 
and I'm going to share some lessons from IP Australia around why I think that might be the case, all of which you can argue with. Um, so I'm just going to cover off very quickly what is IPA Ventures, because it is a bit different, it is a bit new um, as a way of working in the public service, and then cover off on what we did, why, um, and what those insights rose, were, and maybe some of the potential implications that might exist for your own agency and context. So very quickly, IPA Ventures is sort of a, a hothouse, a uh, greenhouse. It's around incubating and providing that safe space for emergent new thinking um, to allow those new ideas to grow into something a little more mature that can stand up to the pressures of BAU before being trodden on. Um, what we do is really around how can we uh, engage with the bigger questions, the breakthrough sorts of innovation questions rather than incremental change. We don't focus on internal processes or tools, we focus very much on the external facing side, very much on what customers, our customers at IP Australia might need, what the, the IP system as a whole might need. Uh, an easy way to think about that is uh, this innovation facets framework from the OECD. A lot of ac activity happens in government around what we call enhancement oriented innovation, where you leverage tools to do things better. But a big question is around the anticipatory innovation where you, it's more about asking, well, is that even the right thing to be doing? Uh, uh, challenging the status quo, challenging your existing processes, and thinking about what are the alternate ways of thinking given the new things coming online. Um, and so a few months ago, um, we were in the middle of our process in putting some ideas towards our venture board. Um, and one of them was around generative AI and thinking, well, this is a big deal. Uh, the first time we raised it, uh, the board went, look, you can see why you're interested, but no, we don't think it's the right time. A couple of months later, we had another go, and they said, oh, a lot's happening in this place. So is it an opportunity or a threat? And for IP Australia, um, there's a lot of uh, issues around this that we were trying to tease out. So at, earlier in the year, everyone's been talking about these tools. Everyone's been talking about the potential economic impacts. Uh, but I really love this tweet um, where someone talked about the idea of difficulty collapse. That because these models contain all of this knowledge, if you solve a problem somewhere, anywhere in the world, it can then be absorbed by these models and be solved everywhere around the world all at once. That's a very different shift. Um, and certainly in the intellectual property space, it raises some really interesting and challenging questions. And what we know in that picture in the middle, the S-curve, is the tradition in innovation is that things start off pretty crappy, then they can shoot up really steeply, get really better, and then they plateau. Um, at that very early stage, you think, well, this isn't that much better than what we've got already. And the danger there is you miss out on something really big that's going to happen. And so we were arguing that what we're seeing with generative AI is that we're at that early stage and there's a lot more to come in terms of that big steep curve. And for IP Australia, we saw some pretty big challenges or questions that these technologies raised for our intellectual property rights, the registered rights that our agency looks after. So um, patents, uh, for those of you who know about them, one of the key things there is the, the notion of prior art, that um, patents rely on, on uh, your ability to claim a patent, depends on what the prior art exists out there. Well, what happens if these tools flood that prior art space with lots of ideas and notions and things? Even if um, it's not truly novel, even if it doesn't uh, appear so, the ability to discern that is going to take time and effort. So that was already a shift, a challenge for us to think about. Um, designs, I'm going to show you some of that. Trademarks, uh, plant ready rights. There were lots of questions, but fundamentally around the whole IP system was that human knowledge and expression um, may become intrinsically shaped by and intertwined with machine inputs. And that raises, again, 
really big existential questions. And so for our venture board, we have some criteria, and one of them is around that Goldilocks zone where you don't want things too intense, you don't want too much heat because um, there's not much room for innovation then because people just want solutions, but you don't want it too cold because then people don't care what you come up with. So we were arguing that it was just in that right space early enough that things were happening, but not too late where things were set. Because uh, where IPA Ventures really fits is in that trying to high uncertainty, low confidence space where we're really trying to de-risk things as quickly as possible for the agency, to learn about the edge to, um, and turn it into something tangible and concrete that the agency can then take on and use in a practical fashion. And our first product, to give you an example, uh, that we uh, worked uh, on last year was TM Checker, which is an AI-assisted availability tool for trademarks for, uh, aimed at small businesses. So that was a tangible product we built. This um, was another venture where we tried to de-risk and reduce that uncertainty for the agency. And so over a period of 12 weeks, uh, we did six sprints, a lot of interviews, a lot of workshops internally, um, talked with a lot of businesses, um, and developed a set of what we call provocations uh, to try and prompt thinking about what does this mean. Um, and throughout all of this, we were very careful about not trying to frame this as a providing the answers. This was very much targeted as a discovery process. And it meant we could talk to external stakeholders and say, look, we don't know what all this means but we're trying to work out what the key questions are. And it took out some of that heat and danger there so where we could have those conversations without treading in the political waters or, or any of that. And that was well received by um, a lot of the stakeholders. They appreciated our willingness to have those big conversations um, and recognize that, yeah, we're not gonna provide you all the answers right now. That'll feed into and inform a longer term policy process. And throughout all of this, it was around trying to, um, when you've got a big shift happening, it's really important, in our opinion, to try and make visible all of the things that exist. So you can interrogate how this new thing will intersect with um, what already exists. So we did workshops with uh, our colleagues. We mapped out the processes for each of those individual rights, that the IP rights. We looked at the process, the steps, and went, okay, at which points might generative AI intersect and have a, a, a difference that will matter. Um, and it was all about trying to elicit feedback from people as quickly as possible. How do you make this, uh, this big abstract notion of generative AI, big shift like that, into something tangible and concrete that people can react to <coughs> and say, oh yeah, now I get where you're coming from. Because a big issue with this sort of thing is um, what we know in the service design space is it's easy to ask people about products and IT things and, and whatnot. You can test something real and tangible. You can say, does this work for you? Do you like the look of this? Is it the right thing? When it's an abstract thing that hasn't even happened yet, that doesn't work. So you've got to bring that future into the now in some tangible form. And that's what we tried to do. We also ran a lot of experiments inside the agency. We used these tools, we gave, uh, walked people through these tools to help demonstrate, showcase, illustrate what they were so they could start thinking about, well, what might this mean in practice? Um, and this is just an example of where we walked through the patents, uh, right, at, and lined it up at every stage, divided between the internal and the external and thought, where might generative AI intersect? Um, for us, it was really important in terms of playing with those tools because it was important to get insight into the underlying logics of the technology. And so what do I mean by that is that when, you got, when we all got smartphones, there's a set of behaviors that are sort of incumbent in that technology. We don't know what they are until we start using them. But technology pushes us, us in certain directions and it's really important to get a, a sense of what they are. Um, you can't predict how things are gonna unfold, but you can get a feel for what are the sort of norms and rules around that technology. And it was really important for us to identify hypotheses. Um, 
We talk about evidence-based policy, but obviously when you're talking about something really innovative, you don't have the evidence yet. So what you can do is articulate key hypotheses about what you think is true, and then look at ways of how can you disprove that. So an example was we'd have a whole set of hypotheses around each of the rights. One was around the design right. Well, prior art might be a big threat to that. And we looked for evidence to say whether that was a fair hypothesis or not. And that helped us build a, a set of uh, intelligence around this, even though we didn't have evidence about how the future is going to unfold. I'm just going to quickly share some high-level observations um, that we made that I think might be relevant um, more broadly. So for us, uh, generative AI is a material difference to previous forms of AI as it relates to the IP system because it, um, well, one way I heard this uh, expressed the other day actually was traditional forms of AI are domain specific, expert level, enterprise level. They're big machines, they're big things. Generative AI is at the consumer level. It's at the level that anyone here in the room can use without expertise and knowledge about AI. That's a big shift. Um, it changes uh, the capabilities of a huge range of people, and it changes how people are going to interact with our system. So following from that, the barrier for entry for making a meaningful contribution to the IP system has been dramatically lowered. Because I, I don't know, well, if you want to get a patent, it's really complex and hard and expensive and difficult. This reduces the barrier to entry to that substantively. Same with design rights, well, more with design rights. A single person can now produce large volumes of material um, in, uh, to a seemingly sophisticated and professional level such that we can't assume that what we receive is the product of a human anymore. That's a big shift. Never happened before in human history. We always could assume that people who wrote and gave us things, they were the producers and the authors of that. We can't assume that anymore. And so by lowering those barriers to entry, we're going to have more people in our system, and that's going to change the nature of our system. And I'd suggest to you, um, uh, think of any process you have as an agency that you're involved in, with that's got some degree of friction because of the specific knowledge required to interact with it. Well, what happens when that's gone? Uh, third, that generative AI has the hallmarks of a general purpose technology, which is simply a sense that the technology is not just an economic thing, it's going to transform across all aspects of our life, society, economy, everything we, we know and do. Um, and that means you shouldn't assume that it's going to be quarantined to one part of your business or your agency or your organization. It's going to affect every aspect of your work. And it's not just an IT thing. Um, but generative AI is not yet a mature technology. Um, this year, there have been, I think, four or 5,000 new tools that have come out, or pr products or companies that are using these things. The technology is moving really, really fast. Uh, there are new developments every week, every day, some days. Um, so any assumption you have about what it can and can't do should be recognized as an assumption and a temporary one. You've got to have to challenge it again and again. You're going to have to revisit that again and again, because in a week, in a month, in a year, it could well be different. So just because it's crap at some things now, don't assume that will be the case in six months. Yes, there's problems with hallucinations and whatnot, but OpenAI is doing a huge amount of work to reduce that, and so are other um, businesses. And because it's a uh, technology that is still maturing, it means that, um, uh, that it is going to hit every aspect of your business, it means we can't assume that we're going to be able to quarantine this and control this in a way um, that the public service likes to do. We can't say, well, this is how you can and can't use it. It's going to uh, be everywhere. It's already being embedded in a lot of enterprise tools that we use from external side, uh, whether it's Google or Bing or whatever. 
So that means um, we're not going to be able to dictate or assume that people have or have not used it in particular circumstances. So that means we're going to have to build norms as a, a collective. We're going to have to build that capability as a collective. Everyone's going to have to get familiar with this and use it and understand it to some degree um, because the risk of, of not doing so can't be managed by a specific set of controls. And then finally, um, that the impacts of generative AI are likely to come in waves rather than all at once. So it's going to hit various parts of the of your work as an agency, uh, workers, um, parts of society, parts of the economy at different speeds, at different rates. Um, in our own context at IP Australia, we see it hitting our design rights first and fast, patents later, and then the whole IP system. So it's not just a one-off transformation. To give some context to what I'm talking about for the intellectual property system, um, the top layer there is some uh, designs. One of my colleagues used uh, Stable Diffusion, one of the image generators tools on, to say, <coughs> create me some images of chairs. And it has a feature where you can just leave it on. Um, and he uh, created nearly a 1,000. Some of them are terrible, but some of them are good enough. Um, and for a design right, all you need is for it to have physical and tangible form manufactured or handmade and produced at a commercial scale, which just means 50 items. Uh, we 3D printed a couple um, because there are now models that you can use at any 2D image. You can put into a tool that will turn it into a 3D model and then you can 3D print it. Um, so for us, that's a big, big deal. Again, the barrier to entry to participate in uh, anything we do is also <coughs> likely to be dramatically lowered whether it's complaints, whether it's inquiries, whether it's consultation process, whether it's job applications, anything you have that has previously required expert knowledge, don't assume that's the case anymore. Um, very quickly for us, we saw a couple of paradigm shifts out of this. Um, again, humans have always used tools to create things. That's a big part of the intellectual property system. We can't assume that's the case anymore because now the tools can start creating things on their own. The other one that might be more relevant for your uh, perspective is that uh, this shift has been talked about in other contexts, um, but from scarcity to abundance. Uh, you're going to have more actors, more capable actors, um, more people being able to do things at scale than ever before, and so your context, your ecosystem, is probably going to start getting more complicated in ways that you'll have to work through because I don't understand enough about geoscience. Um, but for us, that's raised some big questions about what is our purpose as an organization? How do we fit? It raises some big existential questions for us. And we, um, uh, and Keith can share the, the link, um, for the generative AI work, we created these provocations uh, to really explore those different, different ways that the generative AI might intersect with our work and our functions and our purpose and our processes. And I'll just give you one example here, um, which we call mutually assured bureaucracy. What happens when we have our various processes that people can dispute uh, our findings, say for a trademark, you apply for a trademark and they say, and we say, well, it, it's not um, eligible on these grounds. What happens if the, someone comes back to you and feeds in, you know, ask ChatGPT, uh, write me a response refuting this. It draws on expert knowledge enough that um, you can't just throw it out. It, uh, normally we'd have processes that would limit that because it would require an attorney and attorneys have duty, duties and responsibilities. They wouldn't create something that was rubbish. But what happens when anyone can just write back, well, I disagree, and here's why, and that gives you a 30-page screed that's professionally um, and refers to the act, refers to all of those things, that's a huge time burden. So what happens when we have that mutually assured bureaucracy? Um, no need for time. Uh, so we identified a number of implications for IP Australia. I won't go into those 
into detail, but I'll show you this strategic sort of heat map where we looked at things um, where we thought there were more immediate effects, more medium term, or later, or minimal. <coughs> and we tried to think through uh, that in different ways. So taking that public facing customer engagement and education side for our agency, again, um, people's expectations of what your website is capable of or what your information processes are capable of are gonna change substantially. Um, we played with a, a chat bot um, from a, a tool called Chatbase. It was all publicly facing information. It made a better um, chat bot than the one we had a few years ago on our website um, for a couple of hundred dollars a month. People's expectations of what your agency are capable of and how that information is made available and accessible is gonna change pretty quickly. Um, on the process side there, recruitment, I don't know if you've seen, but anyone who's been involved in a, a recruitment process recently, uh, one of my colleagues was on a panel um, and the person had forgotten to remove part of the bit that they cut and paste from ChatGBT. But you can assume now that any job application you've got has been helped. Um, what does that mean for our processes? Everyone's been moving away from face-to-face -face interviews. Do we have to revisit that? All of those sorts of things um, was just, and we've now got a generative AI working group in our agency to consider some of these things a bit more. Uh, the broad implications for us though were that it was gonna be human and AI. Um, uh, everything you do as an agency, you're going to have to think about, well, how is AI going to intersect with that and play a part? Um, and we can't manage that through purely a technology perspective or a productivity perspective. It's bigger than that. Um, just a couple of other things to think about. Um, I'd make the argument that we can see the public sector as, what, as an information industry sector. We're not a media company, but if you think about the disruption that social media caused for the public process, the public policy context, for politicians, it demonstrates that a lot of what we do is about information. What happens when um, generative AI really starts hitting? Because it's gonna transform how we engage with information and knowledge, and that's gonna be a big deal. So again, don't just view this through a productivity lens, view it through a bigger strategic context. Um, IP Australia is sort of on the first First rows of this, we're more exposed because of the nature of the work we do, which is about new ideas, about new um, ways of thinking, and these tools can help that. But it is gonna work its way through the rest of the public service. So think about um, what the shifts might be in your context. This is one of the most capable technologies we've ever seen in human history, and it's got one of the lowest barriers to entry that we've ever seen. This is a tool that you can ask to help you use it better. That's never existed before. That's a big deal. So things will change um, and it's really important to think about the stakeholders you deal with and what happens if uh, others suddenly have access to some of the knowledge and expertise that previously limited who engaged with you. Um, as I say, we've got a generative AI working group to continue looking at this. We've got ongoing engagement with stakeholders. Um, ongoing experimentation. There's an AI in government uh, task force that's been set up by the uh, Digital Transformation Agency and uh, Department of Industry, which I'm, I've joined actually recently. Um, and there's a community of practice uh, getting sort of set up that I'd encourage you to uh, join and Keith can share the link to that. Um, so there'll be a lot going on in that broader context too but thinking about how will your agency engage with this big shift and how will each of you engage with this? Because it's not, these are tools you can use practically in a day-to-day -day environment. Yes, there are things you should not put into them, but a lot of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis isn't sensitive or doesn't matter in who sees it. Uh, finally, reflections. Bring people along as you can. As I said, that discovery frame was very helpful for us in saying we don't know the answers because no one does. Um, it's not about trying to impose something on 
people or stakeholders. It's about trying to be exploratory and engaging with this shift. Um, there's no right way to, to do this, so start where you can. And things are gonna keep moving really quickly. The hype's gonna die down, but that doesn't mean things are gonna stop. Um, just because you don't hear about it doesn't mean it's not happening. And how can your agency keep an eye on this on an ongoing basis? So I've thrown it a lot at you, um, sorry about that. But um, hopefully that was useful. Um, all right, so I, I do have a quick presentation for you all today to give, give time for questions and that sort of thing, but I did want to take the opportunity to talk about um, some of the things that Geoscience Australia is doing around AI, where some of these conversations are and, and where a lot of these has come from, um, have come from. I'll start actually on the right of that slide with the interim guidance and the work that's come out of DTA. We can provide a link to that if you haven't seen it before, but it is well worth a read. And there are four key principles in that as well, which I'm, I'm not going to read out to you, they're on the screen. Um, where we've come with those four <laughs> principles is the Science and Technology Committee has sat down and had a conversation about AI, the potential benefits and the guidance that has come from the DTA and through that interim advice. And we've actually landed on three Geoscience Australia principles that quite strongly reflect the ones that you see up there. Um, again, and this was brought up by Alex, but there's a lot of power in these models if you were using public facing ones, we, we shouldn't be sharing official, sensitive, classified, or even our personal information on these public model generative AIs. Um, again, a lot of these, until you sort of read them out loud, you kind of think of common sense, but it's still worth always talking about them as well and just making sure that we're thinking about this and we're keeping it in mind. Uh, always adhere to the relevant legislation principles, APS code of conduct, and relevant Geoscience Australia policies. As we've heard, this is moving incredibly quickly and there are policies that are coming up around this. There are decisions coming up around this. If we're playing in this space, we need to be really aware of what's being talked about at government and making sure that we are following those rules. We're transparent about what we're doing and why we're doing it. Uh, and thirdly, and I think this is the most important one in there as well, Geoscience Australia holds the expertise, check the work. We are an organisation of experts in our field and if we're using things like generative AI to help us, it might be in writing a speech, it might be in generating some content, but it's always really important to make sure that we get experts to check the work. AI says things in a very confident manner. They're very well written. Um, and if you don't know much about the subject, you could read it and think it's fact very, very easily. Uh, it could well not be. We do have expertise in this organisation, so it's always worthwhile having someone run an eye over the output before we think about publishing anything or sharing it externally. Now, I'll move down into the register use and, and find out more before I talk about some of our enterprise service offerings. Um, so part of the interim guidance says that anyone who is using a public facing AI needs to register their use with the organisation. We have implemented that in our service management tool. You can search for AI in the tool or you can go through digital services to access those registers. I'm going to add one more ask into that and say even if you're using some of the in-house or enterprise tools that we're talking about here. I'm going to ask you very politely to register those as well. And the reason behind that is it gives us the visibility of what the organisation's trying to achieve with artificial intelligence, what benefits we're trying to create and what platforms we believe are going to give us those outcomes. So if you're using it for the official work, you, you need to register as per the guidance from the DTA for anything that's public facing. If you're using some of our enterprise models, please register anyway. It only takes a couple of minutes. It's an auto close. You're not waiting for approval. Um, but we really want to know why you're using it so that we can start focusing some of those conversations about you know, what should we be investigating more? Where should we be looking for an enterprise solution? Where should we be providing you with some patterns to save time? And how can we learn from each other as well? Uh, there's another option in there, which is just ask a question about AI. That will come to me and my team. I can't promise you we have all the answers, but we can certainly have a conversation about your question, what you're trying to achieve, and talk about way forward. As, as we've heard, this is a discovery piece. We're at the start of this journey. And it's really, really valuable for us to keep having these conversations and try and learn from what each other are trying to do. 
The final thing in this slide is the enterprise service offerings that we have. And I think a few of you might have had the, been in the conversation with Microsoft last week, which I found absolutely fascinating. I actually learned a lot out of that myself. Um, we currently have the Bing AI service offering turned on, and I will reiterate something that Microsoft said. That little protected green box up there doesn't mean government protected by any stretch of the imagination. It does mean that they're not going to share the questions that we ask and feed them back into their learning models, but it doesn't mean that you're allowed to share capital P government protected information in that tool, so please do not do that at any point. Um, <laughs> But this is available to anyone now. You can get there searching through Bing. You'll see that little green protected. Um, this is a great little tool. I've been playing with it. You can ask it questions. You can ask it to refine. And it's been really, really useful to have a play. I suggest having a look at it if you do have some time. And honestly, I'd be trying this tool before I went into something like ChatGPT or one of the open ones that are out there and don't protect our data. Uh, purely because if you are starting to ask it some questions, we know this, we can, we can track it, we know that it's keeping our data in our network. If it's not getting you what you need and you do need to use a public facing one, please register to loop back on that one again. The other ones I want to talk about in there is we have our enterprise agreement with AWS. We, we are working with Microsoft about some of the other things that they showed us in there as well. Um, and, you know, I think it's really, really important that we do look, even if there is a cost associated at the enterprise models where we can protect our data, we can protect the work that we're doing, and we can measure some of these values without potentially exposing some of our sensitive information. Uh, an example I like to use is we might provide something that we think is only a little bit sensitive, but if we have 300 people providing something that's only a little bit sensitive or in the grey, suddenly you have a lot of in the grey out there and in these models. So if, if you're unsure, have a chat to us um, because we can always talk through that and where we can stick to where we have an enterprise agreement, be it AWS, be it Microsoft, be it a new enterprise agreement that we actually want to have a conversation about because you do read about a product that you think is really valuable and will really help your business. Um, as anything with technology, we're looking for what's the problem we're trying to solve? What's the opportunity we're trying to create? From an enterprise view, we, we really want to empower the organisation to use these new tools and, and be leading in these technologies, but making sure we're doing it in a secure and transparent way and making sure we're really taking the opportunity to learn from what each of the areas of our organisation are doing so that we can really um, grow this skill within the organisation learn from each other and, and come together for the best ways that we can use this technology moving forward. And I will end there for any questions, I believe, is what's up next. For